And that brings us to a very special report on new business. And we are joined tonight by two members of our education, uh, the Byron Hills Education Foundation. The two leaders. The two leaders, the president and the chairman. And uh, I'll turn it over to Bill for an intro. Yep. Uh, the reason this is on new business is the um, foundation is proposing to the board that they accept a gift uh, for two, uh, actually several, very significant grants. Um, and those grants are very much in line with um, uh, our district uh, our district curriculum initiatives. In particular, our technology initiatives, and uh, this, these grants will uh, update and renovate two labs. Uh, we will go from, uh, very quickly, we will go from desktop bound labs to uh, labs that uh, allow us to do teach kids robotics, electronics, coding, um, uh, quite, a, quite a shift. Um, in addition, they will um, help us to model some 21st century classrooms. Our classrooms throughout the district are, are pretty traditional, desks in rows. Um, and these will allow us to experiment with a whole variety of different models for classrooms. And what, uh, what, what that will do for us that's really significant is uh, we don't have to select a model and do what other districts have done, hope that's the right one, and then buy new furniture for all your, your buildings. So th these are great. And these are coming on top of a huge grant in the fall uh, called um, uh, full steam ahead. These grants together, I think, by far represent the largest dollar contribution the foundation has ever made to the district, over a quarter of a million dollars. Um, this is tremendous, um, and this allows us, you know, I'm always saying we're going to stay under the tax cap, we're going to stay under the tax cap, this year the tax cap's next to nothing, how are you going to do that and make any initiatives? This is going to allow us to, to really do some significant things and to keep pushing forward. So Jason and Lori, thanks for all of your work on this. Um, and uh, let me invite you to speak. So I, mean, I guess technically it has not uh, approved or voted on yet, correct? Correct. You're going to hear from okay. you first. <laughs> you want to, then we'll decide. You want to wait? Then. <laughs> no. Let's see what you have to say. Based on these comments. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank so, you for accepting our yeah. money. <laughs> My, uh, so so I, I'm Jason Burland. I am the chairman of the foundation. This is Lori Kanner, as you know, the uh, president of the BHEF. And on behalf of the entire foundation, uh, Lori and I want to thank you for considering and hopefully shortly <laughs> approving um, you know, these, uh, these grants. And over the last two years, the district has obviously uh, greatly enhanced its technology initiative. And we are just so pleased to be able to continue to partner with the district to bring the STEAM curricula to uh, all the students in all of the schools in the district. And, and, and we think that this latest round of uh, grants, the 21st century classrooms and the STEAM labs can really do that. So we, we really want to thank you for all you do. And, and thank you and the Education Foundation for visionary leadership um, from our community and, and, and for our school district. And uh, this, I, what I see here is that this year it totals $315,000. Um, pretty incredible. And it just goes to show you that our community that's contributing to this are very generous and very education oriented. And again, the leaders from the Education Foundation, from our community, incredible visionaries. So thank you. Do we know what the running total is from the foundation? We gotta be close to $3 million, is that? Uh, from, from, from 1994? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's over three. It's, We're over yeah, three. It's, it's closer to four. Yeah. It's, it's four three million. in the 3.8 range, closer to four. Incredible. Yeah. Ira? I remember many, many years ago, Tom Harrison, other Byron Mills parents came up with this idea of having a foundation. And we all thought it was a good idea, but we didn't figure just how much of a good idea it was going to be. 
And when you look at foundations that are run by other school districts, some of them very, very good in some districts that we compare ourselves to, or they compare themselves to us, and other school districts, realize how incredibly blessed Byron Hills is with the support of this community. Uh, as Bill said and other board members, it, it really enables us to do things that other districts can only dream of. So uh, I, I, for one, remain in awe of the amount of money that the foundation is able to raise for such worthy causes to better the education of our children, which is why the hell we do all this anyway. Um, so uh, on behalf of me anyway, I, I just couldn't be more excited to, to uh, support these grants, uh, especially now knowing what a, a solid process is in place to have these grants vetted and approved by the administration before they come to the board, which wasn't always so many, many years ago, but has been so for many years, and I think it's really made the relationship between the board and the foundation so much the better and such a mutually supportive one. Uh, so I congratulate you both, I congratulate your board, and I really congratulate the community on what they continue to do for the students at Byron Hills because it's, it's really nothing short uh, of superb and how, how well the students benefit from this. So. I, for one, would move to accept these gifts with great gratitude. Hey, can, I, can I have a motion to accept Byron Hills Education Foundation Fall uh, 2015 grants? With great gratitude, so much. And a second? second? Any other comments? I would just say that I, I think there's been an evolution in the foundation over time. In addition to the fact that you guys have done such a great job raising money, there, the, because of the relationship with the administration and the ability to really have a longer lead time on just thinking through the right way to deploy the capital, it's, it's so consistent with the mission of the district and with what's happening in all four schools that I think that the money is just going to be put to such good use. I, I think you know, over, maybe in the past, it hasn't been quite the same. It goes and, back a number of years. Right, and, yeah. and I, think, I think that's a, it's a great step in the right direction because it's just it's money that will be invested in such a consistent way to the strategy of the overall district. So donors should know that, and I think we all take great pride in, in working together. Okay. All right, we have a and motion. thanks uh, to Tim and Andrew, who were uh, critical to uh, actually all the grants that are that are being approved. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, it's been a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Okay. Motions on the table. All in favor? With gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You guys do have the money for this, right? My drawer. Good night, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we now move to item nine, which is our special report budget hearing to review a proposed 2016 2017 budget expenditures by administration for special services, technology, fine arts, curriculum, and instruction. And we are joined by our uh, special services, Jill Boynton, our technology director, Andrew Taylor, and our fine arts, uh, Deepak Marwa, and Tim will represent our curriculum. And I'll turn it over to you, Bill. And we're, sure. and we're officially opening budget hearing two. We're officially opening budget hearing two in the, uh, in among the required five budget hearings. So, um, uh, you know, I don't want to belabor it with a lot of blah, blah. Uh, I want to thank um, the three directors and, and assistant director who's come tonight, really appreciate it, uh, you coming out at night and uh, helping the board to better understand what your proposals are. Let me leave it there. I'm up first? Okay. So the curriculum budget. Um, there's a memo in your packet um, that outlines some details about the specific lines and some examples of how money is spent within those particular codes. Um, I'll just give you a broad picture is that my budget supports two main areas, which is professional learning opportunities for teachers and administrators, and program support, which could include web-based materials, could include other instructional materials, and includes um, other instructional supplies and materials as well to support instruction and curriculum. You'll see on the budget I have a 4.6% increase. That's the largest increase I've had since 2008. I've done a few incremental increases around the Common Core implementation and around APPR, 
but overall have managed to keep the curriculum budget relatively steady. But there's a, a few main reasons for that increase this year, the need for that increase. Uh, one is that we spend a large proportion of the curriculum budget in the summertime um, to pay teachers to come in and do curriculum work. Um, and that's a great time that teachers love to network is not interrupting the classroom and they um, can really concentrate and do focus work during that time. So we do a lot during that time and also some technology training around that time as well for teachers. And this summer will be the, uh, we had a, in a, the last BHTA contract an increase in that contractual amount that we pay teachers. So I needed to compensate for that so I didn't have to decrease the amount of time teachers spent, but we'll be paying teachers a little bit more in the summer based on the last contract negotiation. So that's driving the increase a little bit. Also, with the, techno with the technology and STEAM uh, curriculum, uh, providing a lot of staff development and materials and supplies to support the work that we're, we'll be doing over the next few years around STEAM. Um, what Andrew and I have really learned from studying the implementation so far is to see the impact in the classroom is to provide professional development for teachers. And so I want to make sure we have that support in place for them. And the final thing is you will see a new code for new program materials. Um, I'm anticipating some materials for new programs. For example, next year when we do a K-5 math study, we'll be looking at, we'll have to purchase a new program, uh, whether we phase it in over the course of the year. Um, but that'll be an example of, of some new program materials. In the past, I used to budget, um, I used to sort of borrow money from other codes where I had savings, and I think it's more prudent to have a code directed toward new program implementation. Um, I anticipate some new programs in science and social studies in the future as well as the curriculum is changing. Um, so that's sort of the big picture of my budget and what's driving it right now. And I'm confident that we do have the funds to support our ambitious efforts going forward. Tim, what about as far as the Common Core, mm -hmm. aka I guess the, the learning standards as they're changing? Sure. Is there money in here to anticipate those changes that are coming? Sure, there will be, and that we might not feel that for a couple of years. So, you know, they'll be doing the study next year and then the year after making some revision. So it's going to be at least three years out for that piece. Okay. So I think between looking at the math study, doing some social studies work and science work, following that will be the common core and you know, like that. Um, to, the only question, Tim, just to make sure I understand the timing of this mm -hmm. math and then the social studies and science. Sure. Is is the beginning of all that in here, or is or all three of those things not next year? Anymore? Yeah, not all next year. Not no, all next year. And there's money set aside for you know we've been doing science work for a few years. For example, we've had a staff developer working at WAPIS for the past three years on integrating some of the next generation science standards in the science units. I have that in a the contractual uh, line. Um, some money set aside to hire consultants for that through BOCES. It's relatively inexpensive and you get aid back on that as well. So we have some good staff developers through BOCES that work with us. So this is something I'm anticipating a little bit of new fund with the math program. We may do pilots next year, so I want to have money aside to purchase materials for that. Okay. Other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your support. Yeah. Thank you. Andrew, 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 So in technology, we have really um, four focus areas that we're focusing on in our vision and planning for the year. And that is technology itself, looking at the infrastructure and hardware, resources that we have with inside the district, looking at the software that we're purchasing and ensuring that it's being used and monitoring software uses, and the content as well within technology. Professional development, both online and face-to-face -face professional development for staff. And as Tim said, we work very closely in, t in, in choosing those professional development opportunities and presenting them to the staff. And then this year we're focusing on spaces, and that's kind of was the grant that you just received from the foundation, is to really think about 21st century learning spaces and, and what we might need to do differently to get students really thinking about engineering and design with inside the classroom and within our labs. So our budget really focuses in uh, five areas that 
that support those four initiatives, and that's looking at uh, instructional technology staff, hardware and software, professional development, maintenance and supply, and the BOCES expenditures. Under staff, that includes our building technology consultants, our BTCs, computer aids in every building. We are adding uh, or uh, replenishing a computer aid at HCC this year, to, uh, which was, um, it was eliminated a few years ago, and we're putting that back in to support all the technology initiatives that we're, that we're rolling out. Uh, as well as uh, tech staff supporting our network and infrastructure, and then myself as well. Hardware and software, this is really the maintenance hardware and software, the things we use throughout the year to keep things running and fix things as they break, um, as well as software, which is, we've in, in the past years, we've, we've bundled software, so most of it sits at the district level so that we can uh, purchase across buildings and get some economy of scale instead of having it sit in the buildings and have much more uh, smaller value. And then looking at our IPA, which is our large purchase of technology uh, that we do every summer, which is an installment purchase agreement that allows us to spread the cost over multiple years and get BOCES aid back on, the, on those funds. And then in professional development, uh, professional development inside the technology budget, it, it, it looks relatively small if you're just looking at contractual and conferences funds, but we actually have a lot of embedded professional development as well through the use of our BTCs who are uh, embedded consultants with teachers helping them on a day-to-day -day basis in utilizing the technology, as well as the professional development that we draw from as a district as a whole through, through Tim's department and uh, also some of the BOCI services that we subscribe to as well. So professional development really is spread throughout not just this budget, but also other budgets in the district. Maintenance and supplies really looks at the, the, the in, uh, small parts and supplies we, needs to run, we need to run the, the department. And then BOCES, a lot of our budget lies within the BOCES code, and this is really, uh, we could spend a long time just looking at this area in general, because this is where we look at our wide area, our local area network support, um, our higher level senior uh, technical support staff, this is our bandwidth costs, our, our pipes that run from every building and then back to the RIC for data storage. It includes our data warehousing, our nightly backups, all of that is encompassed within the BOCES uh, COSER. So our financial focuses are really looking at appropriate technology and appropriate resources, looking at making sure our infrastructure is strong to be able to support the continued growth of the district so that we, as we add more Chromebooks and add more uh, technology, we're making sure that we have the bandwidth and we have the network to back up all of those devices that we're adding as well as looking at professional development and really focusing on the four C's and how we can use the four C's uh, within the classroom and helping teachers really realize the, the use of four C's in design and engineering and that sort of thinking skills that go along with it. The fourth one is really in gray because uh, the interactive whiteboards is really not in this budget, although part of it might come from our IPA this summer. Most of that is coming from our Smarter Schools bond which is a separate funding that we're applying to the state for. We've already, we've already been allotted the funds, but we have to apply for, for it, and there's a process, and we'll, most of that, that, that area will be taken from the Smarter Schools Fund, which is $333,000 that we're receiving from the state. And then fifth is looking at the lab spaces and how we can rethink classroom and lab spaces in this new environment. So what does this mean for Byron Hills? It really means that we're, we're making sure teachers are prepared, our network is strong, we're focused on the 21st century curriculum, uh, we're future focused, we're looking at spaces, and really the last bullet I think is an important one is, is really we're being looked at now as a leader in technology across the region, and people are saying some of the things that we're talking about, the things that we're doing here, as really being models of the way we should think about technology and integration in the classroom. Okay. The uh, IPA, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, what's happened to that over time, what, how some of the assumptions uh, have changed, uh, what's in there? Uh, you know, way back at the beginning of my tenure on the board, it was always an annual issue. Oh, we're replacing computers in every 
building uh, once every four years, and once we get through all the buildings, we start again. And there were five desktops per each classroom, and that was a big discussion point. But now, and that was all done through the IPA um, uh, and through the BOCE, so we get aid on it. But that's really gone. You know, I don't know what's in there now, and I don't know whether uh, the assumptions underlying it are uh, that we need to cycle this technology faster or uh, that we can eventually get to a point where we can start saving money? Well, we, we're, we're still in a growth phase right now. We're actually still adding some more Chromebooks to the overall infrastructure. The high school has asked for some additional cards for next year. So this is probably the, the last year, maybe one more year of a little bit more growth in the uh, saturation of Chromebooks within the, in the, in the district. We, we focused last year's IPA, which, is much, which was a little bit larger than the previous IPAs, because we were, were supplementing uh, foundation funds to make sure that we were able to go one to one, three through, um, three through eight this year. Um, so that last year, a, lot, a large proportion of the, the IPA was focused on growing the number of Chromebooks, going one to one, and also uh, making sure that our, our network closets were well, well saturated with battery backups and making sure that they had the capacity to run the, the, the tools that we were putting on it. One of the things that we were noticing in the previous year was that the um, access points that we were putting were drawing a lot of power from those closets that we weren't really ready for. So we actually rewired all the closets with, with higher voltage uh, battery backups to make sure that we could support that. That was last year. This year, we're uh, gonna do a little bit more growth with the, with the Chromebooks. We have a couple small network things, but I think this is the last year that we really need to focus on that. And then we're gonna to start to get into a four-year replenishment cycle so that with the ones we started two years ago, now the, the, the Chromebooks we had two years ago, will be on year three year this coming year. So we're gonna to need to start thinking about replacing them in a, in a year or two years out. And a four to five year replenishment cycle is sort of what we're planning for the Chromebooks. Uh, but we are also this year upgrading some desktops, a very small amount in, uh, in labs, a couple labs that, we're, that are still needed for, for traditional programs, and office spaces. Uh, most of the uh, computers in the, the, the building offices are aging out, and they're already past end of life, and so we're going to be replacing those. So when you get to saturation with the Chromebooks and you start replacing them, are these are all leased from uh, through BOCES, so we just turn in a bunch and we get a bunch? Or do we have to, or do we own these things and have to dispose of them somehow? No, if they're, we can turn them into BOCES. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah we turn them into BOCES. And I, and I don't think that we'll do a, a large swap out like that, but we're, there is going to be a large number that are, you know, just need to be replaced because they've got cracks and things. Mm -hmm. They're used every single day by students. When you have one-to-one, -one, these kids rely on them, use them every day. Uh, we are noticing in, in, uh, some breakage that we're, we're looking at uh, getting some, some uh, sleeves for them to make sure the middle school, especially when schoolers are, you know, they're transporting them from class to class. So we're noticing that we're, we're looking at getting some uh, uh, carrying cases for them to uh, mitigate some of the damages that we're having. Which is which in the scope of the number of Chromebooks we have is still relatively small, and it does not warrant us looking at any type of warranties uh, or replacement insurance because the cost just doesn't. Uh, you know, kids put them in a backpack, treat them like a book, and toss their backpack, and you yeah, know. it's a learning curve. So yeah. we really need to get to teach them that this is not a book. You know, you need to hold and carry it a little bit differently, and and so we we have a couple screens of a month that we're we need to replace, but in the scope of things, it's not significant. And how's our, our Wi-Fi and our networks, are they running to capacity? And We're going to increase next year. We're currently at 300 megabytes uh, of our bandwidth. We're going to go to 400 uh, next year. Uh, we have the capacity to go up to a gig um, with our current infrastructure. I don't think we'll, we'll need a gig for uh, any, any near time. Okay. Uh, but I think we'll probably be settling around four or five hundred megs because we are we are peaking every once in a while on our bandwidth. It's not consistent though. Mm -hmm. and just, yeah. just to add to that, I guess a couple of years ago there was you know the bandwidth um, increase. Um, so 
large infrastructure around the network is nothing. You know, what we have in place now looks pretty good for, I don't know, what's the upgrade cycle on <laughs> Five that? Years. that type of, right, <laughs> same, what's, what's the upgrade cycle on that large, you know, more capital intensive, you know, yeah, we should get a little bit longer time than that. I mean, we, we the the wiring is in place, and we're not going to really need to upgrade the wiring in a long in a long time. We should get seven to. You know, you don't know right now, but I would say seven to ten years, somewhere in that range. Range we should be able to get out of our network uh, access points or switches. Uh, we're we're looking at them and figuring out where we need to replace it, though, so that we're not we don't come to a uh, a place where we have to replace the entire infrastructure at one point. There's nothing, uh, I guess the other point, without getting specific on budgetary constraints around that, is there anything out there that you know you, you feel is gonna be a major technological constraint or capital intensive over the next several years outside of some of the stuff that's you know, been presented? Um, no, not that I can, can see right now. I mean, uh, we, we seem to be in a really good position right now. Uh, we're, we're always monitoring our bandwidth to make sure that we're getting all the bandwidth that we need, that we're getting the support. It's not being bottlenecked anywhere. So we do a lot of monitoring and holding uh, our bandwidth providers to testing and making sure that uh, we're getting what we need in that area. Sure. Um, but right now, I think we're in a very good spot as far as our network, our infrastructure. Really, right now, what we need to start looking at is a replenishment cycle. Uh, and some of the, the Chromebooks are a little bit hard to create a, a I know it's going to be five years because they're newer devices. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a four-year replenishment where it might be a five-year replenishment. It might be a six-year. We don't really know right now, but a four-year is a conservative estimate. We'll get at least four years out of them, and we'll start working from there. And then as we start using them, and we'll, we'll have a better understanding of the, the lifespan of them. But I think four years is a conservative estimate, and I think we're, we're in a good shape right now to be able to you. you had mentioned that our district is looked at now sort of as the, the leaders in this area of technology. I don't think we ever used to be that, right? I mean, it used to be more that we were no. cautious. To the contrary. I'm not saying that we're not cautious. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying what, what has changed? Why is that that we're kind of perceived as One of the there? things that we've been really focusing on, and I think to not really, really address this a lot, is we don't want to just buy things to buy things, and we really make sure that there's professional development supporting everything that we do. And so that when we, when we go to do something, we're really making sure that teachers are at a point of readiness to be able to make it be successful. Because the worst thing about technology is, oh, here's a piece of technology, go use it. That never works. So we really want to make sure that the teachers have the, the capacity to use it, and we're being thoughtful about how we're actually uh, purchasing the technology. For example, the STEAM initiative, we're not just integrating a lot of tools, we're actually focusing on creating a K-12 scope and sequence. That's something that a lot of districts say that they, they have or want, but they're not really working a lot towards getting that exact scope and sequence. And we're really focused on, we're not going to have it by September, but we're working out over the next year or two, we're going to have a well-drafted um, understanding of what types of of uh, STEM-related activities are happening at every single grade level, utilizing these sort of, these these advanced tools. Well, that's one of the things that I, I have to say that I've always appreciated with this district, as far as technology is concerned, is that we've never just jumped in and taken on a new technology for technology's sake and have curriculum, you know, fill in later on. It's always been curriculum, curriculum, and, and learning driven, and, and um, it's good to see that that's still. The rooms are a good example of that. Mm -hmm. The rooms. It's easy to say, well, let's just create a really nice room and make it nice and fancy, and, we'll, and, and then hopefully people will use it. Later, right. But our, our approach has really have been, what is the need of, need of the building, the need of the, the, the teachers that are going to be utilizing it, and then from that point, creating a groundswell of, here's the types of tools you might really focus on your needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a different approach to say, like, you know, we're not quickly buying stuff because that's really not meeting the needs of the teachers. We're really focusing on uh, how it's going to be best impact. Great. Just one other quick question. We talked about um, the Chromebooks and then talked about the infrastructure. The other, I guess, big item out there, smart boards that are aging. How do you think about that? Or, or do we have a lot of smart boards that are failing? Are they still in okay shape? And I know you've experimented with some other you know, technology to potentially replace smart boards in some classrooms, but how does that factor into thinking about 
budget over the next you know couple of years we do have a lot of uh, smart boards that are starting to age out and we're doing some maintenance on them this year our, our, we've been really focusing this year on piloting some different options out there we piloted uh, um, some LED TVs with touch Chromebooks we this past uh, several weeks we've had Promethean boards uh, that have been circulated around to all the building as well as the new smart LED TV uh, boards and so this next week we're going to be collecting data from all the teachers on what features they saw from these different options are going to best meet their needs and then we're going to use that to make some decisions and so we may not be able to replace all the boards in September or throughout next year, but I think we'll be able to get a significant number replaced, which will give us some, uh, some, some smart boards to have for parts and for replacements. And then over the next two years, we should be able to replace all of the, all of the boards. If, depending, there's a, there's a large variance in the pricing of each of those options. So depending on what feedback we get is going to depend on whether we do this in a one-year plan or a three-year plan based on the, 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 the results of our, of, our, of our data we're going to collect. Okay. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Fine. Ah, Joe Boynton, Special Services. Welcome. Thank you. Um, special services encompasses a lot of areas, and I thought um, it would um, uh, be a, a good start tonight to go through um, the scope of that, which I would certainly um, talk to you about how students uh, become a student with a disability. Uh, I noticed on your agenda uh, there's always information that you receive from our office that is from CSE, so I'll go through a couple of acronyms, I'll, I'll talk through the process with you about how students do become classified. Um, and for our budget, um, on the screen, there's a 2.6% uh, increase. The areas that are up there right now are salaries, equipment, uh, contractual and other, BOCI services, and materials and supplies. And um, once I go through certain areas about program, you'll see there is a fluctuation, uh, usually in special education, and it goes back to those mandated services and programs that are recommended to students based on the Committee on Special Education recommendations. So under special education or special services, we are responsible for students from preschool right up to grade 12, which also can be for students up to the age of 21. They are entitled to stay in school until the, through the school year in which they turn 21. Under our office also is, um, it's called ENL now, which is English as a Second Language. It's now called English as a New Language, ENL. School nurses uh, fall under our office, although they report to the building principals and they provide direct support to students in their buildings. Um, homeless, if any students come to the district that are homeless, that also um, is part of what we do in our office. And contracted occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy services, vision services, hearing services, which could be itinerant services or itinerant vision services based on students' needs. Now, you probably are wondering how do students even become uh, classified or a student with special needs. Um, this can happen in a number of ways. First of all, there could be a suspicion that the student has a learning issue or there's a, a disability or something that's, you know, amiss with what's happening with them in school. We can receive referrals from professionals in the building, the instructional support team in the building, which is made up of staff in, in the school building. We can receive referrals directly from parents. They can write letters to us requesting that their child be evaluated. We can also receive referrals from doctors. Once we get that referral in our office, we process that information. We may have conversations with the building uh, staff and building principal to determine have they tried any interventions at the building level. And then if we are set to proceed with the referral, we send information home to the parents. We cannot proceed without um, consent to evaluate from the parents. And once we receive that in our office, on two sides of the house, for preschool, once we receive that consent, we only have 30 days to complete evaluations and come to the table as a committee for preschool special education. And those are not our providers that conduct those evaluations, those are agencies on the outside because we work with the county for preschool. On the school age side of the house, there are providers, there are school psychologists, the contracted speech providers, OT, if the student needs evaluations in those areas. So we get the consent from the parent and then we have 60 days from the date that's received in our office for our staff to do the evaluations, 
right to record, and then we are responsible for um, putting together the meeting. The meeting. And the meeting consists of, and you see it says CSE is Committee on Special Education. There's a chairperson, well, the CSE chairperson. There are mandated members in the, in the um, group. You have special education teacher or gen ed teacher. The parents are part of that team. And the objective is for that team, the group of people on the Committee on Special Education, to determine, based on evaluations, is the student a student eligible to be classified as a student with a disability or not? If they are, then we have to, of course, through this whole process, follow the commissioner's parts and order regulations. But then there are 13 classifications or categories that we would determine based on how the students function. And for that, the committee writes the individual education plan. And when you see that on your agenda, that's what you're approving. Either they were initial referral meetings, they could have been program reviews. We're also required every three years to conduct a lead evaluation for those students. So if you add up all the students in our district right now, we have 324 students that are classified with a disability. 74 students are preschoolers with disabilities. So that's a lot of meetings because everyone's required to have one a year, which is a lot. Um, if, you, if we look at programs that we provide and you hear LRE, LRE is Least Restrictive Environment. So the committee's responsibility at those, at you know, a particular meeting, let's say for an initial for a student, it's the committee's responsibility and we're bound to that as well, to provide mandated services in the least restrictive environment. We start with the continuum of services and we look at regular education or general education with maybe related services or a resource room. And then we look to see, okay, do, you know, the student based on their needs, um, do they need maybe a consultant teacher model where we have a special education teacher push into their classroom? Maybe it's the integrated co-teaching, you've been hearing about that where we have a special education teacher and a general education teacher team teaching either you know for a good part of the day in the elementary school or it could be for one academic subject in the secondary model. We also have students that might need special classes and most of our special classes are for the ungraded students they're like an eight to one ratio eight students to one teacher we have 12 one for the younger students and then we have 15 one which is typically what you hear in the middle school and high school, up to 15 students with special needs and one special education teacher. We also have some students, there are 20 students that are placed out of district. Those programs could be in a neighboring school district, in a consortium district. We have students that are placed in BOCES programs because their needs require um, them to have a certain level of support that we don't provide. We also have students that are called tuition paying students, meaning that their home district has sent a referral to my office uh, or to our office to say, hey, do you have a program that would meet our students' needs? Let's say, for example, that um, Rye City sends a referral for a student here to come to maybe our ungraded program at the high school or one of the programs in our, our middle school. We have a process in our office. We, we take in the referral, send the information to our school psychologist in the building, to the special education teacher in that building. They review that information. They go and observe the student in their own school. Then they come back. They let us know, you know if the student might be a viable candidate for our program. Then we contact the director of the special services office in the sending district. They, in turn, contact the parents. And the parents then come and bring the student here. And they do what's called an intake. They come to look at the program. They come to see what we have to offer in the environment. And then if everything continues to move, in that direction, we send an acceptance letter to the sending district. The sending district then sets up the CSE. It's their committee on special education that sends the student here. It's not ours. So we have a few students. We have four this year, and their districts pay tuition for their students to come here. The students are in the flexible support program, and we have uh, two students in our ungraded uh, language communications class at the high school. Um, there is a difference um, also once students uh, let's say they attain their goals, the Committee on Special Education can also make a recommendation that a student becomes declassified. Students that are declassified, the Committee on Special Education can recommend maybe supports for the remainder of the school year. Let's say if, if, if the committee met today on a student, they could say, okay, the student's been in a resource room and they have program modifications and test accommodations. The committee can make the recommendation for the student to continue that for the remainder of the year. But the one thing that remains in place for those students through the entire rest of the time that they're at school until they graduate are their test accommodations. So that's another important piece for E-class. There is a difference between students that are classified and students that have 504 accommodation plans. 
five or four accommodation plans are for students that have a major life function that's being impacted by their disability. Typically, if you think of a student that might be a student with rheumatoid arthritis or a student that's a diabetic, um, the two areas that you look at in five or four accommodation plans are access. Can the student get to school on time? Like the diabetic whose sugars might be too high, maybe they can't come in right away in the morning, they have to adjust it, maybe they need to leave a little earlier, but it's an access and academic. Uh, are the two prongs that you look at for 504 accommodation plans. And the main gist of 504 accommodation plans is to really level the playing field for those students. There are students that have test accommodations in their 504 plans as well. And are the 504 plans, sometimes those are reversed as well too? It could be for a temporary situation? They can be, but typically for a 504 accommodation plan, the student would have that. But any, any of the students, a student that has a 504 accommodation plan, a student that has an IEP, and even a student that has English as a second language, for, for those students it's mandated and they have to test out, but for the other two, for 504 and IEP, the committee can reconvene at any time. So for the ESL students, we do have seven students in the district right now that receive ESL services. We have students that receive transition services, which means they're phasing out of requiring ESL services. And we have two students that are served in Tarrytown in a bilingual standalone only program because we don't have a bilingual program here in our district. And those services are mandated services as well. And in the past two weeks, we had a few families that moved into the district and we're going through the process with our ESL teacher here of determining whether or not the students require those mandated services. They do. They administer a home language questionnaire. They give the student a lab R to test, it's a language test. They look at their reading, their writing, and their, their oral communication. And then there's a determination made what level does the student have for ESL services and how many minutes are they required to receive. And students that are at the beginner level, they require 360 minutes of ESL services a week. So that's another area under our office. Can I digress for a second? Yes. Because Somebody was in another district was telling me a story that they had in one year 75 students show up and, and needed these services, oftentimes in high school, and they were completely unexpected. You know, that number was unexpected. Like you throw a district, you know, just off the, off the rails. It can. Um, I know that in past experience, like in, in over the course of maybe like a three month time, um, you know, you can have an influx of 20 students that move into your district and some of those students can have the requirement based on their last IEP because that's what we have to go by. Let's say they were, you know, in another district or in another state that, you know, you looked at their IEP and they require intensive therapeutic supports. That can happen to you. Um, it's unlikely that you have that many students. It is likely, though, that you can have students, you can have that many students that move in that either have a 504 accommodation plan or an IEP. But the part about do they, how, you know, what type of service do they need? Is it a therapeutic support type of program? Is it something that's more intensive than what we have to offer here? And that's where it is. There's that fluctuation because you just, you, you know, you just really don't know always, you know, who's going to come through the door. Um, but we uh, are developing our programs. We do have the continuing services for obviously, you know. With your support and looking at the budget, looking to increase the entry to co teach uh, so that we have it in eighth grade, so now our students will have it in sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, so Sorry, what was that? You just for said that? The, the integrated co teach for eighth grade. Oh. So, looking at programs and looking at least restrictive environment, which is what we need to do, um, are we providing supports and services to our students in general education, in general, general education class? with a special education teacher co-teaching. Was that the, um, I, I see a, a jump of 105% and it's uh, ESL teacher HCC, could that be what that is? Sorry, that's specific. I don't know if it's is that the co-teaching. Yeah, for the co-teach, yeah. Is that what that is? Okay. Yes, yeah, HCC. But over the course of the last year, I really have focused on our programs here in the district, looking at our staff, looking at professional development for uh, the integrated co-teach, looking at the continuing services for our programs, looking at our staff, the, the usage of our staff, the aides, uh, looking at our nursing services, um, you know, do we have the proper amount of supports in place, uh, looking at processes and procedures, um, are we following the commissioner's regulations, you know, I've put some different processes and procedures in place as well. Um, looking at related services, the related services for the students in our district, um, as you know, um, they are contracted services for occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. 
Um, so we're, we're going to continue to look at that. Uh, but the Committee on Special Education for Students makes those recommendations, and we have contracted staff that are part of the committee uh, that make those recommendations as well. Um, so again, back to the special services overall budget. Uh, there is a little bit of fluctuation when we look at programs that students might need uh, as far as um, you know, the VOCI services or depending on like students they might move in and out like we might have a student that's in and out of district placement and their family might decide to leave and move but then someone else might need that level of support and it also depends on what the committee recommends based on the related services that are also attached to that um, and I think that's about it I gave you a lot of information but I gave you background information because I thought it was important for you mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Just one question on there. There, there are students that we send out to other districts because we don't have the programs in house that would be most appropriate for them, and then there are students that we get from other districts where we have programs that are great that they may not have. Is there anything that you see on the horizon with the dual goals of trying to create the best experience for students and being financially responsible, where there are programs that we have that you'd want to enlarge to attract other students from other districts, or vice versa? Are there any programs that? we should be sending you know, kids out, Any, anything? I think the two areas, we, we now have unrated programs, um, and because of the cohort of the elementary at Komen, um, we, do, we, for the next year, are not looking to have like a language communications class, but we do have that, right now we have it there. We will have that at Wampus, at the middle school and the high school. That program, across the board, in the entire district has done really well. And the students in our high school program, we are focusing on employability skills for them, mm -hmm. uh, right, being, uh, you know, working in the community. Um, so I would like to look towards expanding that program, and we actually got a referral for a student recently from a neighboring school district, um, and we're about done with that process, so we'll be accepting that student into the, the program in high school. So to continue to focus on that program and, and expand that in each of the schools, and then once we have another cohort for the little ones coming in from preschool, certainly have it back because it really is helpful for the four teachers too because they have to continue that across. Um, and looking at, at other programs out of district maybe for our students, um, you know, the, med the more medically fragile kids, um, you know, you, you look to see do you have cohorts, do we have cohorts of Byron Hill students that are in another district where there are small groupings and it's really tough because our district is not really large so we we may have Singleton students that have a very specific need in our, or in another program. So uh, I like that we have the continuum of the 812 ungraded program here in our district. I would like to look at you know, continuing to expand that or fill the seats. Mm -hmm. uh, same question about contractual services. I know we spend an enormous amount of money if we're you know, doing right by the kids, but we're also obligated under state law to provide all of these services that. Have you done an analysis um, of at what point can we hire somebody in-house and save money? I, I have not done an analysis, but that certainly has been on my radar since I started um, a year ago. It's something that we went through the RFP process spring of last year, and I've only been here a couple of months. Um, it is something that I want to continue to really look at and do that analysis and say these are the services that are recommended for our students. Staff as a whole are looking at that too. Um, you know, do we require the push-in services and really, really with an eagle eye looking at the supports that are being recommended. Yeah, I would appreciate if we get, you know, that kind of, my sense is that we are employing full-time a lot of third-party consultants, we send them enough business so that they are 100% full up and we're paying them X dollars an hour. Now, we're not paying benefits and things like that, but it's got to be cheaper to bring it in-house. And if you have your own occupational therapist, let's say, then you know we would have more control over what your schedule is. Right now, with the contracted staff, sometimes they, they want to work part-time, so we have multiple people working for an outside agency and we want to have a meeting on like Tuesday or Wednesday, we can't because maybe they're working in another district. Or, so for, for us too, it's really important to have our own staff and because we have more control over what they're doing and where they're going. And, and it's and consistency of who that student is seeing too. You know, you, well, we're going to get you the services, but it's going to be four different people over the course of the next month. Yeah. It, it is one of the areas that we need to, to just continue to look into. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions or comments? I guess I just lastly on the you know at 325 students or so, what's called that 12, 10, 12 percent of the overall population, right, of our district. Has that been pretty much stable over the last say five years or something like that? Do we know that? It's grown a little bit. It's growing. It's nine percent. Was eleven percent, nine percent, ten percent, eleven. This is the first time I've heard twelve. Is it really twelve? Well, I'm, I'm thinking three hundred and twenty-five students on twenty-five hundred. But we have a big boom this year in those numbers in preschool. I mean, it's almost yeah. Of those numbers, remember Jill said seventy-nine. Okay. Yeah. Are preschool, and that's happening. I don't know. We don't the class state class. across the country, and I think that's an awareness issue, and not necessarily a uh, an anomaly in that demographic. I think people are just more and more aware of the services that they're entitled to before they start public school. I mean, there's a whole industry out there on this. Some of the successes around early intervention, too, I think, are big motivators. And that's <coughs> money well spent, too, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Jill. And Karen Kushner, I should say, is here as well, too. Thank you for your support in this as well. And that brings us to five minutes. Thank you, Pat Merlock. I'm up. Great. You're up. You're up. Good evening. The curtain's up. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much. This is your first budget for us, right? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. You're supposed to sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> I, too. I did warm up before I got here. So. <laughs> Thank before, you for the Before you start, sure. <laughs> Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> fantastic. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, outstanding. What a, what a performance. Thank you very much. We're so, we're so proud of those kids and the whole department, whatever. It was just one of the better things I've seen in the Bible stage. Congratulations. Thank you very much. What a first musical. Uh, they did a beautiful job. I was very proud of the work that they've done there, yeah. too. You then asked me what musical should be next year. I'll, I'll wait for that email. <laughs> um, but we already uh, have some ideas. We can talk. No, but so, <laughs> seriously, it was a wonderful performance. Thank you. Well done. One of the first things you ever told me was, you know, I'm glad you're here. Just make sure you don't do a Disney musical. Now you got the hang of this district. <laughs> <laughs> well done. All right, thank you. Well, as the newbie here at the table, um, really a lot of the information that I'm going to present to you here in the budget is really based upon just a few months of having been in the position. So a lot of the things that I'm going to say were actually based upon the fact that I inherited a budget that was, I think, really, really well crafted by my predecessor, Joy Barley, and approved by you and the community. So if you would allow me, I'm just going to go over and kind of go over a quick overview of what we're doing in the music and art program here throughout the district. And then I'll quickly go through some of the variances that you see there, but I think it's clear that there aren't that many. Uh, so first, the budget that I've inherited has really allowed me to support instructional goals in both the music and art class from Coleman Hill all the way up to the high school to continue some of the art enrichment opportunities that we've been able to provide. Also, it's been able to help us provide ample supplies in art and music, which include uh, a lot of supplies in the elementary and in the elementary levels and into the middle school and into some of the technological things that we need in the high school program. Also with the expense of instruments, sheet music, and instrument supplies such as reeds and those things, they come up like crazy. Um, it's also helped me to provide students with the opportunity to find out of district opportunities. This year so far we've had a number of students uh, present in the Armonk Outdoor Art Show the Allstate Music Festival up in Rochester, uh, part of the New York State School Music Association Conference, the All Area Allstate, which is for high school students, which, present at, which presents at Student Purchase, the All County Festival for our elementary and middle school students, and another one is the Young Artists at the Katona Museum of Art. And uh, they've been doing beautifully. Our students are really showing their work, both music and in art, throughout the district and throughout the county. Um, as I said earlier, the budget itself is somewhat similar. Uh, most of the changes are due to salary increases. So, um, for example, in the art department, uh, some of the things that we're doing there are that students from Coleman Hill all the way up to HCC are still being offered general art courses, which are project-based and give students the opportunity to create original artwork. And a nice component that I'm starting to see now is that I think it's really because of the conversations we've had based on the inquiry question 
that the students themselves are now starting to question what is art. Hmm. So as I go into these, uh, to the younger schools, um, I, one of the things that I've really noticed, particularly in Wampus for this particular one, is that the teachers are not only just giving them something to work on, but also having them uh, explain why they think that this is art. They're giving them historical context on things from ancient Greece and say, well, this was something that they used to transport oil. Is this art? And the kids were like, no, it's just a container. But then they would say, well, if you were to find this on the street now, where do you think you'd see it? And they'd say, well, in a museum. And all of a sudden they're like, huh, okay. So one of the things that I thought was interesting was a fourth grade student, uh, the fourth grade class was asked to write what they think art is. And if I could share this with you, a student wrote, what is art? Art is everything. For example, furniture, clothing, buildings. Art is beautiful, art is fun, art is creative. And you can share what you believe in through art, which I thought was great for a fourth grader to understand that it's not just crayons and construction paper, but it's something that really exists all around. Um, moving up to the high school program, like I think it'd be a, a wonderful program where every student takes the prerequisite course of studio art, and then they follow a sequential program, which ends in five, one of, uh, well, five NCAP courses, and right now we have AP 3D. This is our first time this year offering the AP 3D course. AP Art Studio, AP Graphic Design, AP Photography, and Advanced Film Workshop, which is the end of our film sequence there too. In the music budget, uh, our instruments have been replaced and services needed, so there really isn't much need to purchase a lot of things at this point, and it puts us in a very good position to make sure that the instrumental students and the program itself continues to be strong. Uh, the only increase that you can see in music is under contractual and other services, and that is an increase for HCC's vocal music program, which is one of our biggest programs, particularly in that building, where our teacher, our vocal music teacher there teaches about 300 students just in the choir program itself. So in a way to support the work that she's doing there, we've uh, hired an accompanist to come in and work with her for about two to three days a week to also play her concerts. There's, there's a consistency there too, at this point, between the accompanist and her. The accompanist herself is also somebody who has worked in this business for quite a while, so there's a support system there. And uh, it's really provided the teacher at HCC the opportunity to not only focus on classroom management issues, because you can imagine with 60, 70, 80, 90 students in a class, sometimes classroom management will take over, but now she's really starting to provide specific instruction, instruction that she can really give to the students based from music points of view instead of, hey, I need you to stand here and there. So it's been very positive and she's excited about the things that are happening and I've seen even since September a substantial amount of growth. Uh, so that is the big picture as far as the small increases that I provide there. Thank you. Questions? Uh, I, I didn't check the line. Are you asking for additional funds for Bobcat TV? Uh, only to increase salaries for the consultants that work there. That's coming yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a separate session for that, yeah. Okay. What's in uh, terms of the number of students uh, holding steady, going up or going down in terms of the music program? Well, we have 100% participation in HCC nearly. Well, if you right, count, if you to, count, right. yeah. if you you count music. choir. Well, choir, band, and which every student has to take music there. Yeah, right. until... Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, inquiring about uh, band and orchestra, the kids who play an instrument. Is that, is that, because that's optional, is that uh, number going up or going down or it holding steady? Be, between six, from sixth grade all the way up to eighth grade, it seems to stay mostly steady. And the and same with the choir program, which is getting better and better. The drop-off point where I'm starting to to look at is the transition between eighth and ninth grade, right? Where I think we go from that having about a hundred percent participation in HCC to about forty percent, right? But that forty percent number is that is that number because I think once they start in ninth grade, that forty percent number stays steady through graduation. Yes. yes. Is that forty percent higher or lower or the same as it's always been? That's the the trend that I'm asking. Oh, at this point, it's been the same, and I'd like to see that get better. I'm, my belief is that if we can get students to take some of the ensemble courses right at the beginning in freshman year, that they'll stay and that'll actually happen. But it's, I think, one of the things with the program at HCC into the high school is it's the first time that they have an opportunity to escape 
yes. music, you know? Yes. And they have these courses that are really specific, like drawing and painting and all this. Uh -huh. So it's an opportunity for them to say, hey, I've had music since fourth, since kindergarten. Maybe I really want to delve into this. So it's something for me to really work on. And are there opportunities for the high schoolers to get back into it if they decide, or is it by that time it's beyond them? If they drop off, say, freshman year because they want to go the art route? Right. I think there are opportunities that we haven't looked into in the past. In choir, that happens quite often because the choir program really doesn't have the same amount of skill set that's right. needed in order for them to continue. One of the things that I'd like to do moving forward is to see if we can change the way that we name the in, the incoming classes, which are con, which are called a concert band and concert orchestra. Right now, they're called ninth grade, but I don't think that there's a need for that. I think it can be a place where if a student comes in for ninth grade and doesn't take a music class, that in their 10th grade, they can come back into that concert, which is the entry level group, mm -hmm. and for there not to be a stigma about right. being with freshmen. Mm -hmm. well, makes sense. Right. Good. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. So now I'm going to go to 9.6, which is just the budget steps from here, uh, just to let the public know. Oh, well, I'm supposed to do public information services. Oh, that was after it, but. Is it after? Well, I don't know, that's why we could, we could change it around. I'm go just following, no, I'm I just think, following the agenda. I think. Uh, public communications to 9.7. Yeah, it does well. make sense. Yes. We will let you leave us now. <laughs> You're welcome to you stick don't have around to for the rest life, of We life. can figure out this we'll agenda it, without uh, you here. <laughs> take a quick break. And, uh, Good to see really you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. You want to do that? This doesn't make sense. I know. It's just following the agenda. Here's a couple of things coming. Special ed report was very good. <laughs> It does seem really like a sink, right? Yeah. Let's just follow this thing. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. And let's just follow that. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? At all, as long as I'll get you covered. Okay. Okay, so I am just going to I am just gonna reiterate the budget steps from here, which is just 9.6. So today is budget hearing two. Next week, Tuesday, March 22nd, is budget hearing three. And again, at that budget hearing, that is the second and last opportunity for the public to have any input as far as additions or deletions to the budget, very important. And at that budget, we are going to talk specifically about transportation, athletics, operations and maintenance, operations and maintenance, and revenue. Yes. And revenue. Uh, revenue. Revenue. Yep. So we have to find out how we're paying for this. Okay. And then on April twelfth, this budget hearing four, and at that point, it's pretty buttoned up. And by April 26th is adoption of the budget by the Board of Education. May 3rd is a mandated budget hearing five where the community is um, given the, the budget. Um, and the vote is on May 17th at HC Crittenden, open to everybody from 6.30 to 9 o'clock as long as you're over 18. You have to live in the district for a year. Um, not be a felon. And, and not be a felon. And you do not have to be a registered voter. It's right. It's 30 so days. if you right. have if days. you have a teenager who's eighteen lives in your house. You have to live here thirty days, right. Thirty days, not a year, thirty days. So just come in and, and vote. Your your name will be on the list. You call it show ID? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. And we are going to pop back to nine point seven, which is Public communications, and Bill, you're going to talk to that as part of the budget from public communications. Yeah, yep, this is a relatively um, small budget. The only uh, we foresee doing all of the same programs <coughs> next year that we do now. You know, this includes things like Bobcat TV, Spectrum, Budget Brochure. Um, uh, we anticipate doing all of that the same, no big increases or changes. Put in a little money uh, so later in the year if we decide. Uh, uh, historically, we've given Bobcat TV consultants the same percentage that teachers get, which would be like one point something. Um, so we put that money in in case we decide to do that. But beyond that, and a, a little bit more time, you know, because this year we had, um, uh, we don't plan to use more time. In other words, there's not a specific need. But for instance, this year we had Bobcat TV do the, um, uh, the advocacy uh, night. You know, that wasn't a regularly scheduled program. We want to have the flexibility if, if we need them to be able to do a program like that. Mm -hmm. 
And what about the, tr the training that it's been used for? Are we going to be doing more of that? Jen, uh, are we doing more training? Resource? For human resources? I mean, do you see that? For Bobcat TV? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do see it, particularly for substitutes. Mm -hmm. You know, running a, a training program for them so that everybody's receiving. They all receive the regular training for policies and protocols, but um, about how to be an effective substitute. So, okay. you know, there are, there are options for others. Okay, so that's considered too. Yeah, that would all be covered. There's okay. no no problem. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, that, that concludes for uh, the public communication part? Six. Yep, yes, okay. yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, any, any other questions or comments on, on public communications? Okay, any other considerations or questions right now? Of course, we'll have opportunity again next week to delve into other areas further? Any well, I mean, I mean, I would ask whether the administration has any items they wish the board to consider that doesn't appear on the budget. No, I think, uh, you know, we've proposed a 1.3% budget that achieves all of our goals. The big things happening are we can, we really want to sustain the initiatives in technology and 21st century learning, and this budget does that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Comments from the public? Susan? Okay. Hearing none. Well said. Um, <laughs> any board member requests for further information regarding changes to the proposed budget, budget as it stands right now? Any comments? Okay, so this concludes budget hearing two. Okay, thank you, everybody.